How can we better pay attention to our senses and enjoy the world around us better? That's what we're going to find out today. All of our knowledge begins with the senses, proceeds then to understanding, and ends with reason. Immanuel Kant. Today we're going to talk about the senses and how we can enhance them better. We're going to talk about the book, Life in Five Senses by Gretchen Rubin. How Exploring the Senses Got Me Out of My Head and Into the World. I like Gretchen Rubin. I like her as a writer, and I think she has good ideas. And this one was interesting when the book came out. She started talking about how she was going to enjoy her senses more. She started this campaign to actually go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art every day and try to engage all the senses in her brain. Well, then the pandemic came, and that was kind of the end of her plan for a little bit. But she really wanted to do a deep dive in it and understand what this sensation, she calls it. It's a combination of, you know, our nose, our eyes, organs that bring in sensation, touch, all those things. But then our brain pieces them together so that we have a complete picture of it. For example, we hear liquid dribbling and then we smell gasoline. Uh Uh-oh, trouble. Or we, we smell our favorite glass of wine. Oh, good someone's pouring wine. We get this idea across the board of what's going on in the world around us based on these senses. I won't even go into how complicated vision is, but you think you see a picture and it has color and it has depth and it has shadows. Believe it or not, we see it all in different pieces parts. We see the shadows, we see the angles, and then we see the color and the intensity and our brain pieces it together in an image. It's not like a TV where the image is just getting plotted out on a screen. It's very complex. Back in college, all starting students who was going into research with sensory research. We had this device in college, and it was basically a tilting machine, very slowly tilting. And we'd put people in the dark with some sort of an image. We would figure out at what point do they understand they're tilting. It's not as clear-cut as you think. Our senses are very geared towards this, But it's not instantaneous. We piece together, like I said, this world with all of them. She even says that we have additional senses from the main ones that we understand. One of them is called proprioception. And this is the one I was talking about. On that tilting machine, does your body understand where it is in place in space? And that was the test of it. People don't have as good of a sense as they think they do. Me, when I started out working out with my trainer, I was terrible at this. I step off of curves and I'd fall over. I was just the the clumsy nerd, you know, you have in every sense of the way. My trainer has worked all these years to help me have a better understanding of this. I'm a lot more graceful than I used to be. I didn't realize that was something you could learn. In my head, you were either graceful or not graceful. You were clumsy or not clumsy. No, it's true. You can actually change how good you are at this. There's another one that is called interoception. And that's the ability to interpret what's going on with our own bodies. (laughs) Boy, you thought I was bad at the first one. I am even worse at this one. But, you know, you start your heart racing. Is it because you're love? Is it because you're scared? Or is it because you took some medication that makes your heart race? It's, It's about trying to identify what's going on with you. I have said it before. I have very poor pain registers. I can tolerate pain very well. And even so, when something happens to me. Like I said, I had surgery and my doctor said, you must be in a lot of pain. I said, no, no, I'm pretty good. And then when the surgery happened and he said, how do you feel? I'm like, oh, this is much better. Well, I thought you didn't have much pain anymore. I don't really recognize the fact that I'm in pain until the pain is gone. Boy, two bad senses I have, but there's more, you know? So it's, it's the idea is that these senses are trying to tell us what's going on in this world. And she says that the brain is living a very quiet life. It it sits in our skull. It it doesn't have any sensations of its own, right? If you get a headache, if your head is cold, those are sensories on the outside of your head. Your brain is floating in fluid inside of your skull. She says it's about 73% water and accounts for 2% of the body weight, but 20% of the energy we consume. So in my mind, I always thought, do I have to exercise? Can I just think real hard about things and then use up all those calories doing it that way? 
Apparently that's not how it goes. But all this comes in through the nervous system and pieces together the world we have around us, everything we see and everything we feel with our skin and what we smell. And she mentions too that when we lose a sense, maybe a person goes blind or loses their hearing, the other senses heighten to try to make up for that loss. It's an amazing system that's trying to make sure we stay safe, but that we also have this deep understanding and appreciation of the world around us. An interesting thing happened a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned I had COVID. And you always heard in the news that sometimes people lost their sense of smell and then eventually, and then also along with it, their sense of taste. And I had a very light case. I mean, I was, you know, fine. And I lost my sense of smell. And it was gone for probably about three weeks. And I wasn't freaked out about it. And I didn't find myself upset. I found out, you know, I remember in the pandemic, a lot of people were very upset about it. And it was just weird more than anything. I could taste things as long as they were things that didn't require smell, like saltiness. You could still tell textures of things. But I suddenly started realizing how really salty the food I eat is because when that became the only thing I could taste, suddenly it was very apparent to me, I got to cut back on salt. But it came back and I hoped it would come back. I was worried, like, is this going to come back? Because I look forward to smelling flowers. I look forward to smelling the campfire, smelling the just the earth around me. And so I really appreciate that. Some people found that they liked not having the sense of smell because they were less lured by food. And that's kind of interesting too. So our senses are important to us, but we can also get along if we were to lose one. And again, our sense of taste and our sense of smell go hand in hand. Once one goes away, the other one's pretty limited. The sense of taste is very limited. And the interesting thing about it is that every person's different, unique. I don't like spicy foods. My friend loves spicy foods. It makes a meal very unpleasant to me if it's very hot, you know, like hot peppers and that kind of thing. We have different senses of taste. It's just how we operate, I guess. And it adapts. So I mentioned that when you eat a high salt diet, you start getting accustomed to the amount of salt you eat. And it isn't until you do some kind of a, like a cleanse that you wipe out salt for a while, you can reset a little bit more towards what normal salt should taste like, but you just want more and more and more. Same with sugar. We become adapted to a certain level. We get used to certain things and it just doesn't go away from there. And so just even understanding we're different from everyone else, how our senses were, instead of maybe being, I don't know, dismissal of what other people like or what other people think, it doesn't help us at all to dismiss what other people see, smell, think of at all. And instead, just understand we're all just special when it comes to how our senses experience things. Boy, that whole blue dress, beige dress thing comes to mind. I was the person who saw the blue dress in an office of everyone seeing the beige dress. Boy. And it just shows you. Same thing with that uh, tone that sounded like a word being said. When there's insignificant information coming into our sensory areas, the color's too hard to tell, the sound is too hard to tell, it suddenly will go in the brain and piece things together, try to figure out what exactly is going on. It's why we see eyes in things like electrical plugs or in trees, because our brain is trying to put a pattern together, put a recognition together. And so it's using whatever senses it can have. And if the senses are subpar at that moment, maybe because the light is dark or some situation, it'll still try to put down a piece together. We don't think of it as a dangerous thing so much anymore, but think about you have to go outside and get fresh water. You hear a rustling noise in the dark. It's not much light. Light's expensive and hard to reproduce. Is, is that a tiger? Or is that just the wind? You know, our brain is trying to help us live. And by piecing together whatever information it can get, it'll help us do just that. But now our senses are more than anything enjoyment of life, more so than worrying about the tiger living outside of our hut. So there are people who still have bears and things. You know, I live in bear country, but I don't have them in my yard. So my brain can relax on anything 
like a bear or a tiger attacking me, but it still is trying to be on top of things to make sure. So when it combines all these pieces of information in together into this entire picture of the world and something doesn't map, you know, something isn't quite there. We thought we heard a rustling in the side of our house. I thought it was just the wind, but now I smell a tiger. I don't know what tiger smell, but you know what it is me. So the brain is not only just coming up with a judgment, but from then on, it's going to consistently try to figure things out. It's going to figure out what is going on. Imagine food too, right? We come up with this idea of what bad food smells like. And so we think, wait, does this chicken smell bad? So you, you eat it and then it tastes a little funny, but again, smell and taste are connected. And suddenly you're like, oh, I don't feel very good. Now your brain is like, okay, whoa, 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 this is bad food. Don't eat it anymore. It may even cause you to throw up because it suddenly senses something is really dangerous here. And our brains also go towards a bias. If we're not used to hearing tigers or bears rummaging around in our trash bins, we won't suspect it and our brains won't suggest it because it's very unlikely. Or if we think, well, there's nothing that should be wrong with this food. Your brain might even turn off its warning signals about it. I was at a conference for work and they brought all the food home so that we could eat it. And they said they got it in the fridge right away and it was fine. I ate some of it. I was sick as a dog. Nowhere in my brain did I have any sort of sense there was anything wrong with this food. So we also get those kinds of biases. But think too, like let's say you don't like hot peppers and suddenly you get a whiff of something that smells like a hot pepper suddenly you might instantaneously dislike this meal because that is how your brain processes. It understands this is something you don't like. So it also can get biased towards knowing us. She even brings up this famous experiment, and I may have mentioned it before, where there's a basketball game going on and a person in a grill suit walks through the basketball game. How many people saw that gorilla walk through? And it wasn't many. Because our expectation is there is no man in a gorilla suit walking through a basketball game. It is something so oddball and outside our understanding of how the world works, we suddenly just don't even look at it. She even brings up the uh, cup of coffee that was sitting on a table in the last season of Game of Thrones. A lot of people didn't see it because they're not expecting to see a Starbucks coffee cup right there. So our brain leans towards understanding what makes the most sense to it. The professor I worked with in college, she did a sensory experimentation, and this got her, I think, in a little bit of trouble. But essentially, there was a class, and a teacher rolled out a TV to show the class something. Someone runs into the classroom, thrashes the TV on the ground, steals her purse, and runs out of the room. They call the whole classroom down to the police station to do an eyewitness testimony, to see how different, and to see if they could ID the right individual who did the crime. And it was pretty poor results, actually. Our impact of the situation can change based on what we think happened. They even did experiments with having a police officer, person goes burning through town, really high speeds. And so now I'm going to interview everyone who saw that. If I say, well, how fast do you think that car was going? Or if I say, can you tell me how much that hot rod was speeding? I can up the speed of the car based on just the question I asked the person. The brain also likes new things, new places. It takes it in more. I'm that person. I would rather eat at a new restaurant every single time. I'd rather go to a new place every single time. I'd rather travel on vacation to different places and see new things. But not everyone's that way. But what she's saying in this book is that the brain actually enjoys taking in new stimulus, wants to see something new because of the way our brains light up. And that's where she got the idea that she's going to go to the museum every day and see something new, try to see something more in depth. And she also mentions our senses varies too and how much we rely on a sense. I'm okay with taste. It's, It's good or bad either way. And smell, I think my sense of smell isn't as good as other people because I notice I tolerate bad smells a lot better than most people. But I also love looking at things. And when I look at something, it helps me understand it better. 
I'm very big into the sense of touch, which means I also want soft clothes, soft t-shirts or, you know, clothes that aren't prickly. And so I'm very sensitive to that. But taste, smell, not so much. Uh, Hearing, I'm okay either way. But we all have different uh, abilities in each of those areas too. So I think that's a good way of piecing it all together. We're going to talk next time about the five senses and how we can enjoy each of them better. So my challenge to you is just sort of take a long look about how much senses matter to you. Do you love the smell of a good meal? Do you love the way the sunlight looks when it's about to set? Are you really into visual things, tasting things, feeling things? And try to come up with what senses matter to you the most. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. And please remember to subscribe, tell a friend. I'd love to get this community going and see if we can get some good conversations going about all the different topics we talk about. But we're going to have to have more friends with us. So make sure you tell other people about this podcast. And remember, our walk through life with our senses start with small, enjoyable steps. <music>